Okay, so it's a pleasure to introduce our uh, keynote speaker tonight, Dr. Sarah Mostafavi, who is uh, currently an assistant professor both in uh, statistics and medical genetics at UBC. Uh, we learned this afternoon uh, for the meeting with students that she hesitated a long time to uh, become a doctor, uh, to study medicine, but finally she settled for uh, computer science in, in Ontario and graduated with a PhD uh, in computer science from U of T. Then she moved on to be a postdoctoral fellow in Stanford in the Daphne Kohler's lab. Then she had a, a little stint in Harvard before we could hire her at UBC. Uh, and she has started at UBC, I think, a year or a year and a half ago. And we're going to uh, hear her speak today about genomics and the complex phenotypes. Um, so thanks so much, Cedric, and thanks to all the organizers. It's um, really exciting to be here, and I know many of my mentors have given talks here, so it's great for me to actually give a talk here. Um, all right, so today I'm going to tell you about some of the work that we've been, I've been doing uh, and now with my lab in the past few years on uh, using genomics data to understand, to derive mechanistic models for complex traits. And I highlighted the word mechanistics and complex. As you'll see, these are very important words and the type of work that we do. So um, as many of you know, collecting genotyping data is becoming increasingly accessible nowadays. So using commercial companies like 23andMe, you can submit your saliva for a cost of about $200 and get your genotyping data. Um, with your genotyping data, you can make various types of predictions. The most um, accurate predictions today are probably going to be about your ancestry. So here's some predictions about my ancestry. Um, seems that um, 23andMe believes my ancestry, is, my ancestry is coming from Middle East and um, North Africa. And as far as anyone knows, this is very accurate. Um, so, but besides ancestry, you can also make predictions about various traits a person might possess or the, potentially the diseases that they might be susceptible to. So this accessibility has fueled a large number of what are call, called genome-wide association or GWAS studies, where the goal is to identify genetic factors or genetic variants that associate with various types of complex diseases. Um, so I'm interested in psychiatric disorders, and I'll, example, uh, and I'll use examples um, from that domain. Um, for example, if we're interested in schizophrenia, what we would do is that we would collect um, a large number of individuals that have schizophrenia, um, get their genotyping data, and then get genotyping data from a large number of controlled or healthy individuals, and then try to see what are the genetic factors that are different between these two groups. So um, one note of terminology, SNPs are positioned in the DNA where individuals vary from each other. And when we're doing a typical genotyping assay, we're looking at one to five million um, positions. So um, the first thing that you do with genotyping data is to present it in nice um, numerical format by encoding the number of um, minor alleles present at each, at each spe uh, specific SNP or loci. Once you have this um, nice um, numeric representation, then you can apply all sorts of fancy computation and try to uh, come up with very um, good hypotheses or answers. So um, the, major, the major goal is to try to identify um, susceptibility loci. So these are regions or, or locations in the genome where um, that are associated with the outcome of the disease or the, the occurrence of the disease. And once you, you have these, then you can do, do two separate but overlapping um, things. One is to identify, try to figure out what's the mechanism for the disease, where the genes and pathways are involved. And the other one is that you, try, you could try to build a model for risk prediction. So um, given somebody's um, DNA, you can try to make predictions about the, the diseases that they, they might be susceptible to. So as a field, we've done a large number of these GWAS studies um, for various um, diseases. And we've had three, um, I think, very important observations from these studies. One is that, um, first of all, we need huge sample sizes to identify any associated variant. So we need on the order of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, for, depending on disease, to identify even a, sing, a single um, associated variant. And this is because typical um, variants or typical SNPs have very small effect sizes. And that's why we need such huge sample sizes to find anything. Um, the second is that um, multivariate methods that try to combine signal across different regions um, to, to build pr uh, risk predictive models tend to overfit. And that's consistent with the fact that 
um, the effect sizes are really small and the problem is under constrained. We're looking at millions of variants, but we only have th tens of thousands of individuals. And the third and perhaps the most um, important observation has been that GWAS by itself doesn't give us the mechanism. And that's because majority of the associated variants fall in non-coding regions of the genome. And generally, we don't really understand how these non-coding regions affect biological processes. So it's becoming clear that to understand complex diseases and in order to understand, uh, to gain um, um, significant insight into disease, what we need to do is to think about the genome in the context of the biological system that it operates in. The bad news is that biological systems are very complex. So downstream of the DNA, we have um, many layers of gene regulation. We have the transcriptome, we have the proteome, um, we have interactions between many genes, and there's actually feedback in, uh, across these layers. Um, so, and, and complex diseases like psychiatric diseases are, are end result of interactions between many genetic factors or their products which can further be modulated by the environment. So we're looking at a very complex system that we're trying to understand. But on the other hand, the good news is that um, in the last few years, we've had major advances in measurement technologies. We can actually measure various parts of the cell at very high resolution in a genome-wide matter. So besides being able to, to sequence DNA, we can um, we can profile transcriptomes genome-wide, we can look at the proteomes, and we can even measure interactions between pairs of proteins. And by being able to generate all these different data sets, the complexity of the data we can generate is starting to catch up to the complexity of biological systems we want to actually understand and study. So the availability of all these data is fueling a um, field called systems genetics, uh, where the goal is to combine different data types in order to better understand mechanistic models or derive mechanistic models that tell us about complex diseases and traits. So, of course, this all sounds wonderful and we all want to do this, but in order to do this, we're faced with significant computational and statistical challenges. And these are two that I work on. Um, the first is heterogeneity. So we're measuring the cell at various scales and resolutions, and it's not really obvious how to put these data sets together. And the more I think of work on this problem, the more I realize there's no solution that fits all, and it's probably a, a, a problem that should be answered in a very data and question specific way. The second and one of the most important um, challenges is the challenge of confounding factors. And this is what I spend most of my time thinking about or working on. So the problem here is that once we move down from the DNA sequence, what we're measuring reflects or it reflects both the effect of correlated environment and potentially causal genetic factors. And we re need a way to, to be able to disentangle those two factors, just correlation and causal um, component, to be able to get a better understanding of complex diseases. So as an example, in psychiatric disorders, uh, we know that many of the patients abuse drugs, but the fact that they abuse drugs actually affects their transcriptome or proteome, and we need to be able to disentangle that from the, the causal factors that cause the disease. So um, in this talk, I'm going to tell you about um, two projects that try to tackle some of these challenges. In the first project, um, I'm going to tell you about a study about combining genetics data with gene expression data in order to better understand the consequence of genetic uh, variation at, um, in, uh, in biological systems and in particular at expression levels. Um, in this project, I'm going to highlight the problem of confounding factors and why we should think about them and approaching and, and, and talk about models for addressing them. In the second part of the talk, I'm going to tell you about um, an integrative study where we combine different types of data in the context of major depression. And the goal is to, again, derive mechanism that can give us some insight into this disease. So um, as many of you know, um, um, we as humans share a majority of our DNA sequence. SNPs are positions where as individuals we might vary from each other. So as I mentioned, we don't really know what the consequence of these variations are, especially if they occur in non-coding regions. Um, but EQTLs, or expression quantitative trait loci studies, are a very neat study designed for trying to figure out what's the impact of genetic variation is on 
uh, cellular processes and in particular on gene expression levels. So um, how EQTL studies work is that you collect genotyping data for a set of individuals um, and you collect expression data, gene expression data for the same set of individuals. Then you try to look for correlation between alleles that are present at a particular site and expression levels of a, of a particular gene. So an EQTL, is, you can think of it just as a pairwise relationship between uh, the, the alleles of a SNP and expression level of a gene. I'm going to make a distinction between um, two types of um, EQTLs um, because they differ in terms of the mechanism that would describe um, these two. Uh, and that's going to become important later on. So a cis EQTL is an association between the alleles of a SNP and expression level of a gene where the SNP is actually close to the gene. Versus a trans EQTL is an association between a, a, the alleles of a SNP and expression level of the gene where the gene is far away from that SNP. So mostly we're going to be talking about um, cis um, EQTLs uh, and I'll mention why. So um, in the past few years, I've been involved in a large number of um, EQTL studies where we've looked to see what are the consequences of genetic variation is on gene expression level in different tissues and different contexts. So the one that I'm going to talk uh, today about is um, the study using RNA sequencing where we looked at the effect of genetic variation on gene expression in blood uh, in a pretty big um, cohort. So. Um, so one thing that um, is exciting about this study um, was that we actually generated gene expression data using RNA sequencing. Um, so with RNA sequencing, you, you can actually look at many different types of expression traits, not just gene expression. You can look at things like splicing um, and isoforms and see if how genetic variation affects those other types of expression traits. Um, so um, in this study, um, what the, the data we collected uh, consisted of um, gene expression data for about 1,000 individuals and, ge and genotyping data for the same set of 1,000 individuals. So we call this um, study the DGN study. Um, so the first thing I, I did, um, and this is the first thing that many of you do when you first get your hand on a big data, you start visualizing it. And I do this a lot, and it's such an integral part of whatever I do. So um, I started clustering the data, clustering the genes, and um, clustering the patients or the individuals in this study to see what kind of patterns are present. Um, so this is a heat map of um, the gene expression data. You have your individuals here as rows, and you have your genes here as columns, and the colors are showing the, the strength of the high or low expression um, because this is um, standardized. So the pattern that we saw was that there's these broad structures in the data. So if, if you look, you'll see that there's a group of individuals here that seem to be high expressor of this group of genes here. There's a group of individuals at the bottom here that's low, that are low expressor of these group of genes here. So I spent a few months trying to figure out what are the causes of these broad, broad patterns are. And at the end of the day, it turned out that these are nothing interesting and related to confounding factors, which are variables that we don't really care about in our analysis. So um, to tell you a little bit about, um, before I tell you a little bit what, uh, about factors that actually result in these kind of um, structure, I just wanted to mention that um, besides our own study, I went back to two previous RNA sequence studies to see if we kind of see similar patterns. And looking at these two previous studies, we saw basically similar things. If you cluster the genes and cluster the individuals, you see the same broad patterns. So what's causing these um, structures? So what I did was, with a, obviously with a bunch of, with a group of um, great collaborators and colleagues, we quantified a large number of technical confounding factors that are specific to RNA sequencing. So these are things like sequencing depth, GC bias, RNA yield, percent duplicate. So these are <coughs> factors related to um, sequencing technology that might impact quantification, gene expression quantification. In addition to that, we looked at a uh, few different biological factors that might also correlate with gene expression levels, but th those are not of primary interest in what we wanted to do. So um, to figure out the effect of these factors, um, what we can do is to look at the correlation between these factors and, and um, 
principal components of our expression data. So our principal components are going to summarize the broad patterns that we see in expression. And, and once we correlated that, so this, this heat map is showing the correlation strength between each of these factors and the top principal components. Um, you see that a lot of the top principal components, which are basically reflecting the top patterns in our data, are highly correlated with these, um, some of these factors. So one thing that I wanted to mention uh, that will become important later is that some of the top principal components actually don't correlate with anything. So for example, we have PC9 here. It doesn't correlate with any of the confounding factors that we put together. But at this time, we don't know this is because this is actually telling us something about biology that we're interested in, or is it because it's representing some hidden pattern or hidden confounding factor that we just didn't measure. We only collected a, a, what, um, some confounding factors that we know should have an effect, but there could be other ones. So in order to figure out how to actually remove these patterns, um, we went back to the confounding factor literature to see what kind of models have been used in the past. So it turns out that um, almost all existing approaches use a combination of this linear framework. So the idea is that your observed expression data can be decomposed into three types of matrices. Your true expression data, which you don't have, but that's exactly what you want. A matrix that represents the effect of confounding factors, and a matrix that represents the effect of, um, so this is, sorry, known confounding factors, and this is hidden confounding factors. So the point is that if you were able to estimate these two, you could subtract them from the observed expression data to get back the true expression data, and that's, that's what you should be working on. And um, so many of these approaches that have been designed in the past um, propose some ways for estimating hidden confounding factors or not estimating them and for estimating the effect of known factors and correcting for them. Um, thinking about this framework, um, there's two um, requirements that we came up with that, what, that wasn't really addressed. The first is that what if you have noise or missing information in your confounding factors? And um, this has really became a, a question for us when I was looking at the major depression study, which I'm going to tell you about next, where we know we have a lot of missing information in our confounding factor. So for example, drug abuse is one type of confounding factor that we want to account for, but these are based on self-report, so we're going to have a lot of missing values. The second requirement was that um, this, the, the, these kind of approaches have may, may make a very strong assumption in terms of what's a hidden confounding factor. So basically it boils down to any large pattern in the data that's not already accounted for by a known factor is going to be called a hidden confounding factor and you're going to remove that. So this seems like a very aggressive assumption. So what we did was came up with a simple model that actually tried to alleviate some of these um, requirements that I mentioned. Um, so the model we called hidden covariates with prior. I won't go through the mathematical detail, but the basic intuition is as follows. We're going to use the patterns that are associated with known confounding factors as priors in order to identify additional factors that we think are confounding. So in this way, we get some priors about what a hidden confounding factor looks like, and we can build on that. Um, the other nice thing about this approach was that it basically allowed us to have a knob to be able to tune depending on how harshly we want to normalize and remove these hidden confounding factors. So, so now we have our model, we apply, it to our data, we apply it to our data, now comes the hardest part, how do we know we've done anything right? We've removed a bunch of things, but does it make sense to do that? Um, so we can never directly answer this question because we never actually observe true expression data. Um, but what we can do is make some assumption about what normalized data should behave if we've, made, if we've removed something that was obscuring um, our data. So one thing that we use and that was used in the past is to um, calibrate or, or measure the performance of our model in terms of um, sys-EQTL discovery rate. And the logic is as follows. So if you have your genotyping data and you have your gene expression data, if you, rem if you normalize your gene expression data without actually looking at your genotype data, and then you go and observe more correlation between these two data sets, then you must have removed something that, that was obscuring the relationship between genetic variation and gene expression levels. 
so what I wanted to make sure to mention is that this assumption only works when you're looking at cis EQTLs. It's not going to work if you look at trans EQTLs. Um, so, uh, so I won't, the logic might be um, a little bit hard to follow, but if you have questions about that, I'll, I'll be happy to talk about it. So, so, um, so this is basically called the cis EQTL test. How many cis EQTLs are we discovering after normalization? And the more we discover, the better we've normalized our data in order to answer the specific EQTL question. So um, what we did was compare uh, our approach, which we called HTP, with a bunch of other um, approaches and the number of CCQTL discoveries, that's what I'm showing you here, based on different threshold on false discovery rates. So on the y-axis, we have a number of genes with an EQTL. What really jumped out at us is the number, the, the huge increase in the number of discoveries you can make simply by normalizing your data for hidden confounding factors. And this is actually huge because it really can change your conclusion about the effect of genetic variation on gene expression level. So if we were to stop here and look at the, the raw signal, we would have had a completely different conclusion about how genetic affects gene expression level. Um, so what I wanted to mention also is that um, this evaluation is based on a smaller RNA sequencing data set, and that's because we couldn't get some of the other approaches that were proposed to actually scale up to the large DGN study that we had. Um, and, and that was, uh, in, in terms of the, our design of HCP, an important consideration was its scalability. We need to be able to apply it to a larger data set. So um, once we were satisfied with this approach, we went ahead and applied it to our gene expression data set and looked for a number of CCQTLs that we could detect there. And, and really surprising result was that about 90% of the genes expression level was associated with genetic variation nearby to the genes. And you could really see that once you start removing broad patterns from the data. So um, in order to get a better sense of um, why this hasn't been reported in the past, what we did was a subsampling exercise where basically we um, subsample our data set to smaller and smaller number of individuals to see how many EQTLs we would discover with a smaller sample size. And what we saw was a nice um, increase as um, we're, Im we're improving on the sample size. So part of the reason why we saw this trend was because of the large sample size, and part of it was because of um, the normalization approach. So um, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to tell you about um, an integrative study in trying to understand um, genetics and molecular biology behind major depression. And um, you'll see how it relates back to this uh, first study in a few slides. So to give you a little bit of a context, uh, major depression is a chronic um, disorder characterized by persistent and pervasive low mood. And it's um, diagnosed by psychiatrists after ruling out other source of um, low mood that could be explained by acute factors. So um, it's one of the major um, causes of morbidity worldwide because it's a major contributor to suicide. A lot of suicide victims are diagnosed or can be diagnosed with major depression. From twin studies, we know that major depression actually has a pretty high genetic heritability. So um, estimates from twin studies is that um, a heritability of major depression is about 30 to 40 percent. This is similar to a complex disease like um, breast cancer or type 2 diabetes, uh, where we've already identified a lot of associated uh, genetic factors. But unlike those disorder, major depression has been really challenging to study in a genetic way. So the latest GWAS uh, that was done a few years ago, looking at about 30,000 individuals, was not successful in finding even one genetic variant that associated with um, the diagnosis of the disease. So still, we have very limited um, biological understanding of, um, of major depression. And there's been a lot of debate in the field of why it's been so challenging, and there are three main arguments. Um, one is that the phenotype is very heterogeneous, and it might not actually correspond to anything biologically coherent. The second is that when we're looking at GWAS, we're looking at common variants. If there's some rare variants that contribute to disease, we're not going to capture them. And the third is that with GWAS, we don't look at environment. Um, and in particular, in interaction between genetics and environment. We know that in psychiatric diseases and in major depression, in particular, environment is such a big component. 
So a lot of, um, so actually adverse childhood environment is very predictive of development of uh, major depression later on in life. So, um, so when I started my postdoc a few years ago, I started working on this project called Depression Genes and Network that was started by um, um, my mentors at Stanford, Doug Levinson and, and Daphne Kohler. So in this study, um, we generated gene expression data and genotyping data for about a thousand individuals. Um, half of them were patients of major depression and half of them are control. The nice thing about this study was that it was a deeply phenotype cohort. So in addition to collecting their genotype and gene expression data, we had a lot of information about clinical and demographical um, information on these um, individuals. So the strategy that we cho chose was to go deep in terms of number of measurements we're making on an individual versus tall, which is the, the general GWAS design, which you kind of sacrifice on, on phenotyping and you just collect a lot, large number of individuals. So um, there was a few um, reasons why we thought collecting gene expression data is very compelling in this case. The first is that um, gene expression data actually reflects the effect of environment and by that virtue um, will tell us about interactions between um, gene and environment, at least in theory. Second is that um, gene expression reflects the effect of um, both common and rare variant, or it should reflect the both common and rare variants that are functional or doing something to the cell. And the third reason is that um, gene expression is more immediate to the trait that we actually want to study, and based on that, we might have larger effect sizes. But on the other hand, um, there's several important cons to the decisions that we made based on our our study design. So um, the major um, um, challenging factor now is that um, because we're measuring gene expression level, it's easy for gene expression to be confounded by either the disease itself, the, the, the processes that are end result of the disease and not causal factors, and also by correlated environments. And the second um, shortcoming was that because um, we wanted to collect a reasonable sample size, we had to collect data from blood. And of course, gene expression is very tissue specific, so we might not be capturing mechanisms that are going on in other tissues that might be relevant. So um, the first thing that we did was um, to look at the effect of various clinical and demographical um, information that we had on these patients on gene expression level. What does even correlate with gene expression levels? So what we saw was that drug intake was actually the major contributor in terms of factors that correlate the gene expression levels. Um, what I'm showing you here are the number of genes that are um, associated with any of these variables based on their expression level. And I'm showing you results for two different um, normalization of the data. So one is just removing technical confounding factor and the other one is removing some hidden factors plus technical confounding factors. So what you will see is that a large number of genes um, expression correlate with many of these factors. So this really highlights the fact that we need to be able to account for these in order to find anything meaningful because these factors in turn correlate with incidence of major depression. So um, what we decided to do was to use a very conservative approach. Um, we basically come up with about 30 or 40 um, different variables that we think have an impact on gene expression and might confound our results and account for these when we're um, obtaining gene level significant statistics. So here's how it works. For each given gene, we're computing the association strength bet between the expression level of that gene and the phenotype, which is major depression here, accounting for a large number of confounding factors. And we do this using the likelihood ratio test. So once we've done this, we do three things three separate types of analysis with, with these gene level association statistics. Um, in the first analysis, we just, I mean, it's very simple. We look to see if any of the genes are individually associated with um, incident of major depression. In the second analysis, we do what's called a pathway level analysis where we basically aggregate the association statistics across known pathways. So the way we do this is we download a bunch of different um, gene sets where gene sets have been put together based on 
co-occurrence of genes in the same biological pathway and look at ways that we aggregate association statistics across the pathways so that we go beyond gene level association and get a better understanding of biological processes that might be involved. In the third analysis, um, we actually combined this data with the EQTL data that I mentioned in the first part of the talk, because this is actually the same cohort, in order to look for causal chains of association. So can we find some SNPs that affect gene expression and the expression level of those genes in turn affects or correlated with major depression? So what I'm going to talk to you about is actually um, just this one, um, but I'll briefly mention what happened with the other two. So it turned out that at gene level, when we were looking at individual genes, we couldn't find any um, significant findings. Um, and that's potentially because of low, low statistical power because of small sample size and the complexity of the problem. Probably single genes are not going to tell us that much. In terms of combined analysis of um, EQTLs and gene expression, we ended up having one finding, but I think still we were underpowered to, de to do these kind of analysis. And, and given the complexity of the phenotype, we probably need bigger um, sample sizes to look at this more carefully. Um, but in terms of the pathway analysis, um, we came up with one pathway that, that was significantly associated, and we followed up on it a little bit, and that's what I'll tell you about next. But uh, let me tell you a little bit about this pathway. So it's a pathway called interferon um, type 1 signaling pathway. That's an immune pathway. Um, the reason uh, why I became interested in it and, and um, try to understand it a little bit better is as follows. So first, it turns out that subcomponent of this pathway or even um, other pathways related to this pathway sh have shown up in um, other psychiatric diseases and major depression when uh, looking at smaller sample sizes. But these studies weren't that conclusive because of um, smaller sample size and the fact that we couldn't really account for a lot of compounding factors um, that I mentioned. Um, the second reason was that it turns out that interferons, um, which is a molecule or cytokine that actually in, um, results in activation of this pathway, are given to multiple sclerosis patients and hepatitis C patients. And it turns out that a large number of hepatitis C patients actually go on to develop clinically significant major depression. So that kind of made it an interesting pathway for me to try to understand better. So I'm, obviously I'm not a biologist and I had to learn a lot of um, biology and immunology um, when I started to look, look into this pro question. So um, it turns out that, as I mentioned, interferons are, are immune cytokines that induce an immune response. And um, they do this by inducing the expression level of a large number, about a few hundred genes that are called interferon-stimulated genes or ISGs. We already know a lot about the pathway that regulates the expression of, of these genes, but there's still much that we don't know. Um, one interesting observation for me was that it turns out that the interferon signaling pathway has actually been implicated with a large number of diseases. So it's been implicated in um, chronic autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus being the most famous one, also Sjorgen disease. Um, in addition, it's been implicated in a few rare diseases that have both neurological and immunological um, symptoms. And it's been um, implicated in a large number of uh, infections when, in, when the infection couldn't be cleared as effectively. So um, in order to try to, so my question was that um, we know that the subcomponent of, these, of this pathway has come up in all these different disorders, but how does that relate to each other? Is it the same set of ISGs that's coming up in all of these disorders and diseases, or is it a subcomponent of the, the pathway that's coming up? So for this, I need to have a better understanding um, of how this pathway works and what are the genes that are actually involved and how they regulate each other. So in order to answer this um, question, um, what we did was a very big genomic bioinformatics C-type exploration. So I basically went to collaborators that I know are working on gene expression data and asked for all the data that they had. And uh, this was in collaboration with um, an, a consortium called MVAR and a consortium called MGEN, where they were collecting gene expression data from different immune cells in both human and mouse. So my um, hypothesis was that by putting all these data together, we can come up with a more accurate 
network that tell us about the interaction between interferon signaling genes and their regulation in general. Um, and I, I won't um, tell you the detail, but I just wanted to mention that at the time that um, I, I started looking at this problem, there was actually a big controversy in terms of overlap and immune response in mouse and in human and how and why you should not combine data from mouse and human because they're telling you completely different things. I don't know if you guys saw that paper, but there was a big paper that came out in around 2012. Um, so, um, so at the time, what we did was actually look at this question very carefully to see if that's the case in terms of the interferon signaling pathway. And it turns out that the interferon signaling pathway is one of those pathways is that very well conserved in terms of the responding genes. So it's the almost um, very overlapping set of genes seem to be responding in both human and mouse. So uh, to actually combine all these data, what I did was, so we have gene expression data, you have cartoon representation of different dimensions. So we're, although we're measuring the same set of genes, I'm always looking at the ISGs, 500 potential ISGs, you have different conditions that we're looking at in different experiments. So to put all these data together, um, I did a very simple thing, which is just map each data set to a gene by gene similarity matrix. So this is usually gene expression data, so we convert each data set to a co-expression matrix. And once we have these co-expression matrices, we can simply combine them using um, weighted combination. And that's something that's um, been done in the past and works really effectively on various types of solution uh, problems, and it's actually something Combining network is what I worked on for my PhD, so it all came very naturally to do this. Um, so once we have this combined gene expression data, then we can look to see what are the genes that are co-expressed. And the hypothesis uh, or the, the assumption behind these approaches is that co-expression tells us something about co-regulation between genes. So this is the, the network that we came up with at the end of the day. So um, this is the heat map of the network, and this is the network-based graph-based representations that uh, you might be more used to. So what I'm showing you here is a set of potential regulators of interferon response, and on the um, columns are uh, responding genes. So these are ISGs, or interferon-stimulated genes. So what this is showing us is that which genes are regulated by which regulators. And what we saw was a very modular structure. So it seems like there is this group of genes in the middle that are regulated by a small set of regulators here, but there's other players um, in place. So now I can actually answer the question, which is how do all these different diseases relate to each other in terms of the, the specific genes that are implicated in the pathway? So to do this, um, we collected a large number of um, diseases, including um, lupus, uh, arthritis, um, so our major depression study, few other um, acute infections. So now each row is uh, a disease, and I'm highlighting the gene that was um, identified for that particular disease or infection, and this, this plot is aligned with this network here. So each um, column here is an ISG, which is the same ISG going across here. Um, so basically what we saw was that uh, major depression tend to cluster with more autoimmune type disorders rather than acute um, uh, and the signatures that people have come up with in acute infection. So it clustered with lupus, uh, shurgan, and uh, arthritis. Um, so two conclusions um, from this study. Basically, um, when we actually look started to look at this pathway very carefully, we realized that it's not, there's a, still a lot that we don't know about it, and the regulation of response might be a lot more complex and context dependent that uh, we might believe based on um, textbook uh, definitions. And different diseases tend to, um, different diseases that have implicated in this pathway tend to implicate different gene sets along um, in this pathway. Okay, so um, I'll just um, conclude with uh, three conclusions. So, um, so over the years, looking at various types of complex um, diseases and data sets, um, I've become to realize that the major challenge in gene genomics analysis of complex traits is probably the problem of confounding factors and approaches to dealing with them. And um, it really becomes, because you never know what the ground truth is, it's a very challenging problem to figure out how to normalize data, but that's where you make all the differences. How you normalize your data really 
um, changes the conclusions that you can draw. And of course, we all know that, but um, um, to actually think about all the time in practice when we do experiments and we're analyzing data um, is very important. Um, so the second um, conclusion is that generally integrating different types of data really helps in terms of statistical power because we can cancel out um, spurious correlations that might come up in just one data set. Um, and um, my final conclusion is that um, always what we want, of course, is to come up with causal association. And it's really hard to do that unless we can tie back the, the disease we have to some sort of genetic uh, variant that could give us some causal an anchor. But it's still um, very challenging to do that because even when you look at association at genetic level with cellular processes, even though we find a lot of them, the associations are still weak. Um, Okay, so um, I just want to thank everybody that um, I, I worked with. So the DGN study, the depression study that I mentioned, um, was started with um, two wonderful PIs, um, Doug Levinson and Daphne Kohler, that were really crucial uh, in the design of the study and what we ended up doing and, and what we're working on um, now and going with this for depression genes and network study. Um, and so when I was a postdoc at Stanford, I worked very closely with Alexis Battle, who's a great uh, colleague, and she uh, was a major contributor, and she was a lead on the EQTL analysis that I mentioned. Um, the interferon story, uh, I worked uh, with colleagues from Imgen and Inmar Consortium, specifically Christoph Benoit and Hedy Yoshida, and also thanks to my uh, wonderful research members here at UBC that are continuing on, on some of this work. So um, finally, there's uh, positions in postdoc and PhD positions available in my lab. And if you're interested, um, please come and talk to me. And thanks for your attention. I, I'm curious, um, so it seems like a lot of the data is still coming kind of from the sniffer rates and sniff tips and things like that. And it's interesting, you know, kind of thinking of Liz's talk before, where like the main ground is that we can take the So do you kind of yeah. see uh, integrating that kind of genomic data where it's not just sniffs and the whole mess? And, like, do you not yeah. create the whole mathematical framework, or can you just plug it into another kind of the data set? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. So definitely, um, it's very, the way we're looking at GWAS is very limited. We're looking at individual variants, and obviously there is copy number changes and various other structural changes that we're not considering in this framework at all. Um, so I've been thinking about these problems and how do we combine it, and there are some, some things that are, we're working on, but definitely it's not something already, a framework that we can already use, and it's a lot of um, I guess, active areas of research that's ongoing. So, um, the gene expression um, you were looking at was all kind of broad. Yes. I noticed some of the genes that you were saying were important. And you're looking at, at uh, depression, it's brain disease. Yeah. But some of the genes you're looking at being affected are like 200% to be expressed in an important organ. Yeah, so yeah, that's a really interesting question. So, um, so I'm actually part of this big um, consortium called GTEx that's looking at gene expression level across many different tissues. And one major observation that's actually very new to me is that you see residual expression of 90% of genes in all tissues. Residual expression, I mean very, very low level. And maybe if you want to count it in terms of, we're looking at RNA sequencing in terms of read, it would be four or five or maybe 10 reads, but you do see some residual expression. Um, but in terms of the interferon pathway, it's actually highly expressed in, not in neurons, some of the components are expressed, but in microglia and astrocytes, these pathways are actually very active. So I don't, I'm not saying that it's probably the same mechanism that it's in the blood and the brain. We, we're not, we don't have a causal anchor, so I'm not, we can't say that this is causal. I mean, it, it could definitely be correlated, but all we can say is that of all the confounding factors that we knew, we actually accounted for those. So whatever is remaining, um, we don't know, but, but it's not something that we could have accounted for. Non-coding regions, but as you start to gain 
additional annotations, whether it's 3D architecture or yeah. TF binding sites or answer elements being refined. Is there much work kind of following up those hits to annotating them by saying, yes, we have these variants? Yeah. Locations, but maybe they are also disrupting prescription factors. Yeah, that's a great question. So there's this, this field of EQTLs is actually a big one. I'm sure you've seen it. Um, so there's a lot of studies try to characterize where EQTLs lies. And definitely, definitely there's a big enrichment for um, um, co-occurrence of EQTLs or SNPs that are an EQTL in genomic regions that are known to, to somehow affect process, um, function or regulation. For example, enhancer regions or um, DNAs, hypersensitivity sites, and things like that. So there's definitely a strong enrichment for, for things that we're finding in known regulatory regions. And also in terms of 3D architecture, yeah, so, so there's also an enrichment for when you see an EQT or a SNP who's, who's associated with expression level with a gene that's pretty far away in terms of cis regulation, you typically do see some sort of, if you look at um, high C data, there is an interaction between those regions. Because of the treatment in terms of antidepressants? So that was actually interesting. And one of our major concerns was that, <laughs> one of our major concerns was that um, so our patients are taking antidepressants, and that's, and that's going to um, confound all of our results if antidepressants actually correlate with um, gene expression level. But interestingly, in blood, we actually saw that antidepressant intake doesn't really correlate with gene expression that much. And we could actually account for antidepressant because the, the, the cohort that we have is not a clinical cohort. It's a population-based cohort that um, we actually diagnose based use, working with psychiatrists by contacting um, people in the population. So many of the people in our study weren't t taking any medication. M many of them were self-medicating, but, but there were some that weren't taking any medication. So that's why we could actually account for um, antidepressant intake. That had immune diseases? So yeah, so we actually look at that because that's very important. There, there, there turned to be um, few people that actually had hepatitis C, I think about eight or so, and one or two uh, multiple sclerosis patients here. So um, we excluded those when we analyzed our data and we see similar patterns, but we never went back to see our, our dissociation. We see different in those people than the ones that we see in the rest of the population. Okay, great. Thank you very much,